Tonight's lecture is part of the architecture lecture series called Emerge, Emerge which I sort of started as, a, as an effort to kind of introduce the myriad of trajectories that we have in architecture today and all the sort of emerging practitioners who are focused on the sort of the big variety um, that we have out there, which is also, I think, quite sort of um, exemplary of the way Cranbrook Studios go, where each student sort of um, selects a trajectory and kind of pursues their own interests. So the attempt was so that there would be at least one, if not multiple ways of aligning the students' works with the lecturers who come here to both show their work but also spend time in the studio creating students' works. Um, today we had a full day of crits and I think it was really interesting. Um, so tonight's lecture is uh, Givanch Ozal. Her, his, sorry. His practice is, as I mentioned, in artificial intelligence, technology, robotics, and it's a practice that is sort of at the cross-section of art, architecture, visual studies, urban culture. Um, Gwench and I grew up together, and we actually, in Turkey, and we also ended up going to grad school at the same time, uh, coincidentally, and sort of been friends ever since. Um, so it's really exciting for me to have him here. And, um, I'll just read a little bit about his bio. Uh, Givancho Zayl is an architect, technologist, and researcher. He's a lead faculty member and program advisor of IDEAS, a multidisciplinary research and development platform in UCLA, Department of Architecture and Urban Design. Um, he's the principal of Ozal of Office, an interdisciplinary design practice located in Los Angeles. His work is at the intersection of architecture, technology, media, and research on urban culture. A native of Turkey, Ozal studied architecture, sculpture, and philosophy in Bennington College. In addition, he holds a master's of architecture degree from Yale University, where he graduated with multiple awards. Um, prior to establishing his own practice and research, he, research, he worked in the architecture offices of Rafael Vignoli, Jurgen Meyer, and Frank Gehry. Um, among others. His projects and experimental installations were exhibited in museums and galleries in the USA and Europe, such as Istanbul Museum of Modern Art and the Saatchi Gallery in London. He formerly taught at Yale, Woodbury University, and the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. His recent work has been heavily published in online and print media, such as CNN, BBC, Los Angeles Times, Boston Globe, Huffington Post, Architectural Digest, Wired, Gizmodo, um, among many others. His recent design and research on 3D printing was awarded one of the top prizes at NASA's uh, 3D printed habitats competition. At UCLA Ideas, besides teaching his own master's design studio, he continues his research on 3D printing, computation, virtual reality, robotics, interactive spaces and sensing interfaces with support from leading companies such as Autodesk, Microsoft, Oculus, and others. Um, and I welcome Givanch to Cranbrook. A little bit, uh, you know, again, thank you, John, for the introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of a background regarding my interests in uh, the technology and architecture. Um, I am... Uh, you know, I, 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 I would say that I became a nerd rather than being a nerd as I grew up. Um, I think uh, the societal pressures kind of made me become a nerd. And, uh, and I actually take pride in that to a certain point. Uh, I studied uh, sculpture, architecture, and philosophy in undergrad. And then I did my master's uh, at Yale, which was very much so focused on a kind of a, a building-centric um, practice for architecture. And, um, and later on, uh, as I kind of progressed in my career, uh, when I worked, for example, for Frank Gehry, uh, it was, again, this kind of um, unitary vision uh, of an artistic expression Then somebody had to figure that out. Uh, to make it a reality. So for me, uh, we live in a very uh, unique moment in history, and uh, I think this applies to uh, anybody who's uh, 
pursuing uh, any form of artistic pursuit is that uh, the, I think the bridge between engineering and creativity is, 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 is diminishing, or the gap, I would say. And there's uh, such an immense amount of um, um, tools that are available that are much easier to use at ev everyone's disposal that the, 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 the workflow between creating your uh, vision versus uh, executing it is, is actually is becoming a deceivingly solitary pursuit. And I'm going to talk about that further, but the reason why I'm talking about this right now is because we're also surrounded and overwhelmed with uh, such an immense amount of uh, technology and gadgets that are necessary, unnecessary, annoying, useful, useless, uh, as a part of this kind of immense amount of uh, capital that goes into prioritizing technology in human life and culture. So I think uh, we need to, uh, in a way, take charge of that process. And, uh, and from, from my perspective, uh, primarily from an architect's perspective, I think uh, it requires us to look outside the discipline more than ever in order to acquire a new kind of relevance for the kind of work that we do. And it also requires us to be much more strategic and opportunistic about borrowing tools uh, and processes from other disciplines. And for me at this moment, that, that is technology and engineering. Uh, and I think uh, it might end up being that way for a long time. So uh, my talk is, uh, I, I amended a change to the title of my talk and uh, it's called uh, Trans Architecture Now. And, uh, and the purpose of that is to in a way, situate architecture as a kind of a transitional uh, medium, uh, which uh, I think will acquire a new kind of cultural relevance uh, through technology. Uh, if we look at the kind of the dominant cultural forces right now uh, in philosophy, I would say that majority of it revolves around, again, the culture of technology, uh, looking at notions of transhumanism, and post-humanism, thinking about how technology is starting to transform our bodies, our genetic makeup, our primary existence in the world, and how we relate to the outside world. Uh, those are highly spatial problems, and I think uh, it, it, it becomes essential that architects uh, develop strategies and uh, architectural educators develop pedagogies for dealing with that kind of problem. So, I believe that the world that we live in right now, especially the world that we call the kind of the fourth industrial revolution, uh, is an ecosystem of humans, uh, sensors, and robots, whether we are aware of it or not. And uh, as a part of this problem, space uh, becomes an extension of the human body. So our senses are no longer limited to our biological makeup, but are enhanced and is interlinked with the external technologies that uh, are in a way uh, building up around us as large uh, amounts of capital is, is being uh, allocated to, to those realms. Our entire economies are revolving around this, uh, these new notions of uh, efficiencies. Uh, and I think as a result of this, architecture becomes the convergence of interface design and uh, environmental design. And uh, wearable technologies uh, become this kind of bridge that connects the human body to this new highly technologically advanced and uh, elaborate uh, outside world. And, um, and another part of that uh, whole uh, spectrum of uh, issues is that uh, artificial intelligence not only is, a, is, a force, is becoming a force of organizing the world, but also a force of designing the world. So there comes a question of agency about the role of the designer in this kind of new uh, cyber universe uh, where the architect no longer is this kind of uh, unitary singular visionary but somebody who has an ability to observe and uh, divert and convert different currents of uh, culture and technology in different directions. Um, and I also think that uh, through this notion of autonomy that comes with artificial intelligence and this lack of agency, 
from the perspective of the designer, I think when we're making things, we need to move further even from digital fabrication processes into generative fabrication processes, where these processes are in a way intended to, for a certain kind of goal, but the actual output of that process is not necessarily predetermined, but is synthesized by some kind of technological process. And I also think that um, as we spend more time in the digital world socializing with each other through social media, uh, you know, when we are using um, different tools of productivity to communicate with each other at work all day, uh, I think uh, we need to also kind of break down our um, uh, prejudices against uh, virtual worlds. And we need to somehow embrace that virtual reality is a form of reality. Uh, and that form of reality has huge amount of uh, not only uh, practical potential, but also creative and artistic potential as well. So I'm going to talk, uh, you know, through these different kinds of examples, uh, through examples in my research uh, at UCLA, as well as in my office. So um, the first uh, set of issues were, in a way, intentions. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the methods as well. Uh, the methods that are uh, being employed in order to pursue this kind of research is uh, primarily robotics. Uh, robotic fabrication, thinking of robots as construction workers, so that's in the area of 3D printing, high performance materials, and what have you. Um, the second method I would highlight is sensor integration, uh, thinking about um, intelligent environments, collecting data, and in response creating uh, spaces that have an ability to process that data and create behaviors and responses to that data. Uh, user interaction, and th instead of thinking of buildings uh, built by robots, thinking about buildings as robots. Uh, and uh, the third one I would highlight is uh, media applications, such as projection mapping, virtual environments, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality interfaces, and thinking about media as architecture. Uh, and an a type of architecture that has an ability to update and change uh, in the same way that the kind of media content that we consume every day in our screens update themselves and change. And this requires a certain kind of fundamental consideration uh, for architecture, for the physical components of architecture to be designed with considerations of media integration from the get-go. Uh, rather than thinking about media as an overlay, I think architects need to devise strategies to think of media as an integral part of the initial conceptual design consideration so that it becomes much more synthesized uh, to the overall uh, final product that becomes uh, habitable at the end. So um, currently the main focus of the research at UCLA that I conduct is focusing on the relationship between presence and action. Uh, and uh, there are two components to that presence. Uh, one of them is a digital presence, and the other one is a physical presence. And uh, tools such as uh, head-mounted displays, virtual augmented reality headsets, and what have you, create a certain kind of immersion and precision to translate digital, and phys uh, digital content into physical and physical content into digital, and also physical presence into digital presence and vice versa. And uh, robotics uh, in the form of either DIY robotics, 3D printing, or industrial robotics uh, create cyber physical systems that again accomplish the same kind of goal, is that digital uh, workflows are translated into uh, physical outputs, and physical outputs through uh, machine vision and what have you could be documented and translated into digital outputs. And that in a way spans across the entire spectrum of productivity, uh, which I can call work in this context, and play. So if you think about the, the worlds in which uh, the, these kinds of applications are very prominent in the world of play, you're thinking about uh, entertainment broadcasting, you're thinking about virtual social platforms, you're thinking about uh, gaming environments, exhibitions, uh, and also you're thinking about very practical applications such as um, 
maintenance of a building uh, where augmented reality can reveal data that may not be visible to the human eye. On the other spectrum of work, uh, you're looking into virtual meetings, chat rooms, and conventions. Uh, you're looking into human-robot collaboration, industrial production, uh, and you're also looking into temporary and remote work environments, as well as educational environments that focus on learning, training, and what have you. So I would say that those probably are the entry points of application. And then uh, from those moments forward, I think it seeps into multiple different uh, layers of um, social existence. So, oops, is this gonna work? Yeah, so uh, what we are doing primarily lately, which is some of the kind of more proprietary technologies that we're developing, is to control uh, physical uh, parameters such as robotics through virtual environments like in this particular example you're seeing a virtual reality headset and a controller uh, controlling a physical robot and the vantage point of the machine is aligned with the vantage point of the human in order to create a kind of a more collaborative environment that can um, in a way mirror each other but also create a kind of a more streamlined uh, um, context for both of them to coexist in the same experiential plane. Um, and this leads me to a kind of a statement which is about spatial intelligence. So this I would say is kind of the thesis of this kind of uh, line of work which is uh, space is gaining intelligence through a combination of uh, sensors and scenarios meaning there's technology embedded in the environments that we live in and they could be used for multiple different things and we just have to devise scenarios in order to activate their potential. And they also develop autonomous and semi-autonomous reactions to people, to the external environment and objects. Uh, they're formed by a combination of digital as well as physical objects. And uh, they have an ability to change based on various practical social and cultural scenarios. And uh, they constitute of an ecosystem of technologies that I talked about, which are robotics, sensors, algorithmic design systems, electromechanical systems, uh, smart materials, digital interfaces, media technologies, wearable technologies, etc. So the, the first entry point to this thing is the design paradigm, which happens through computational design. Uh, one thing that is happening in the world of computational design right now, which is uh, what we pursue in the beginning is to uh, allow the designer to be the, the kind of the instigator of the design process, but not the micromanager. Uh, meaning the designer unleashes a certain kind of computational process, which is interlinked to other computational processes, and then the designer in a way becomes a kind of jury to decide which process works better than the other. Um, another one is uh, we choose to mostly work in full scale. So we rarely make any architectural models, which I think resonates in this place quite well. Um, in this particular uh, physical mock-up that you're seeing, we attached a hinged uh, wall system uh, to one of our uh, industrial robots, and then we attached a, a video projector to the other robot. And they are synchronized in this kind of computational environment that is controlled by a sensor that detects your hand gestures. And as you move your hand, uh, not only the, the physical um, makeup or the position of this wall system changes, but also the, vis the digital projection uh, on top of this, uh, this wall uh, transforms as well. So uh, this prototype aims to create an environment where you can walk into a physical architectural environment. And that architectural environment has an ability to transform itself through a series of robotic processes, not only physically, but also through media and digital processes. Another example is actually a much more tactile example, where a group of students created a wall panel uh, that uh, senses your presence and moves towards you. And it changes color when you touch it. So the, the intention behind the system is to create a new kind of relationship uh, with architectural surfaces that we didn't have before, uh, 
usually tactility in, uh, in, in, in the history of modern architecture is almost always a visual thing unless it happens in the scale of furniture. Uh, but um, in this particular instance, in order to trigger change and transformation in the architecture, you need to touch it. And uh, the surface is designed to be touched. So moving along to, from the physical into completely digital environments, uh, we are looking into a series, the, I'm going to show a series of examples here, uh, which are uh, environments that are meant to be only experienced digitally. They are not representations of physical environments. They are not meant to be simulations of uh, physical environments. But they are purely digital environments that take advantage of the fact that they're made out of pixels rather than bricks. Um, in this particular example, a series of uh, gesture controls allows you to change the scale of the environment, which is something that you cannot do uh, in, in, in a kind of physical architectural environment. So it problematizes the relationship between object and space. So um, it also allows you to change the, the texture and the color of that environment through a series of design parameters. The second example is about uh, traveling through that environment. In this particular instance, the environment uh, has an ability to grow around you, and you have an ability to teleport yourself to any moment and place in that particular environment through a series of uh, gesture controls. Believe the. So you can pick a location, you can change the translucency of the environment, and you can directly, with the touch of a button, change your vantage point and position in that environment. The next one is uh, gesture-generated spaces, where there's an absence of space, and through, through a series of uh, gestures, you actually generate that space. As you see, when he moves his hand, the space is being generated, and that you can experience and tell, uh, actually move through that space. And as you are generating this environment, you can have a three-dimensional updated map that allows you to pinpoint your location in that particular environment. And uh, one other example is a gaze-controlled space where uh, the direction that you're looking becomes uh, a portal and creates an aperture so that you can actually carve your way through that space by just looking at it. Or you can think about uh, virtual reality as a kind of a design environment, a controlled design environment where you build the space around yourself uh, through a series of predetermined, designer-determined uh, parameters uh, that have a life cycle. So in this particular example, uh, you build up the space, but then it has an expiration date. So in order to inhabit the space, you constantly have to engage in the act of building it. So moving along to some of the more specific robotic applications, uh, this is one of the more uh, elementary exercises that uh, I do with my students, which is I give them a kind of a highly complex object that has a certain kind of shape, and they have to design a, a, an effect, a, a gripper that uh, grabs it. Another example is looking at uh, existing formal systems such as origami and what have you and thinking about how they can be actuated and transformed through the help of robotics. Um, and some of these grippers are highly anthropomorphic and they work with sensors uh, and others do not and others are much more architectural. But what is interesting about this process is that uh, the scale, which is one of the most fundamental considerations of architectural design almost becomes irrelevant. And I find that to be a very scary and exciting um, kind of, um, I would say, like conundrum in the sense that uh, we as architects are very much so obsessed with the notion of scale, but we, in a way, um, don't need scale as a, as, a, as a primary consideration anymore, especially in the world of digital environments. This video is looking at a more traditional approach, which is using robots as workers. So in this particular set of examples, they are doing a series of, let's say, uh, fabrication processes that humans cannot do uh, or would not want to do. Uh, 
And the last one is, uh, is this kind of mixture of augmented reality and robotic motion together. Uh, and these are happening in the scale of like um, combining different kinds of technologies, colliding them with each other, just to see what kind of results uh, they would yield. Uh, and last uh, part of the robotic exploration is, is this notion of telepresence, where uh, combining uh, virtual and augmented reality technologies in order to control robots, but also to collaborate with them. So one robot becomes fully controlled by the human uh, and makes much more intuitive decisions in the fabrication process, whereas the other robots makes a repetitive uh, set of uh, pre-programmed uh, moves in order to fabricate an object. So their motions are in a way uh, happening in the same fabrication plane and they're synthesized so that uh, we can leverage the advantage of um, the repetitive uh, qualities of robotic fabrication with the more intuitive input of the, of the human uh, craft. Uh, in the last set of examples that you're seeing, you're seeing a series of interactive architectural models that work with sensors that have an ability to change and transform uh, their shape through a different series of uh, interfaces like motion sensors, like EEG sensors that, that read your concentration levels in your brain. So any kind of wearable technology or external sensor is a part of this exploration to create a reactive architecture that have, has an ability to understand human motion, human psychology, human behavior, but also has an ability to transform according to those things. And also looking at how this exploration affects the way that we use uh, interface design. So moving on to, I would say, maybe a little bit more of a traditional building practice. How does some of these ideas that happen in the lab in a much more free uh, academic context as, as explorations uh, seep into some of the design works that happen in the office? Uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they happen in very direct ways uh, that are very much so uh, aligned with the way in which you communicate with a client or you communicate with, uh, let's say, an audience, and sometimes they don't. Uh, but uh, the first example that I wanted to show is these uh, series of houses that uh, we designed. Uh, they're, they're summer homes uh, for uh, a small community on the Aegean coast of Turkey. And uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things that were happening in the region was that there was an absence of sand. And the main construction technology is happening through concrete. So, uh, but if you think about environmental considerations in a, in a hot summer climate like the Aegean coast, uh, the most advantageous thing to do is to actually create super thick walls. So we had a, a conundrum there and the way that we propose to solve this is to robotically fabricate super thin uh, fiber reinforced, um, fabric reinforced uh, panels um, that are roughly around one and a half inches thick and also cover them with a material called thinsulate that you're probably familiar with in ski jackets and what have you. That creates this kind of uh, insulation in the super thin uh, wall thickness profile. And also uh, taking advantage of, of, of the requirement which was the individual swimming pools as a, as a kind of thermal mass at the center of the uh, villa in order to further cool uh, the spaces around it. The second example is this restaurant design that uh, we did for a startup in San Francisco that is building the first fully automated burger robot. Uh, their objective is to create a completely automated process to assemble a burger uh, but a bespoke burger, meaning it's not your like run-of-the-mill McDonald's burger, but you specify the kind of meat, you specify the amount of fat in the meat, you specify the toppings, and you create this kind of ultimate uh, uh, burger that is cooked to the perfect temperature that you require it to be. And in a, as a way to showcase this, uh, we had to take some design cues from the traditional burger experience of, um, 
of of a, of, a, of an American diner, like the booth and the and the counter, and we had to in a way reinvent them, and we had to also erase the presence of staff uh, and uh, embed all the interactions of the process of ordering a service into these systems. Uh, so it, in a way, the project is somewhat inventive, but also creepy at the same time, uh, because uh, all these uh, wooden surfaces, in fact, have uh, digital interfaces embedded behind them, which allows you to uh, order from uh, the location where you're sitting, but it also forces uh, people to interact with each other. For example, the furniture uh, was designed to trigger more social interactions between the people that are the that are coming here to get their burgers in the absence of the human interaction that is removed from the equation. For example, in the bar, the way that the bar is devised is so that some people sit into the bar and other people pull up a chair towards the bar and they're facing each other. Um, in, the, in these kinds of um, double stacked uh, tables, one level is higher than the other, so it gives people the opportunity to kind of not be at the eye level with a stranger, but if they want to interact with them, they can kind of talk up or down to them. But if they want to maintain a certain kind of privacy, they're not in the same kind of uh, uh, social interaction plane. If you show up as a group, you can have your own little booth, but you're almost kind of at, on display in the booth, which allows you to, uh, again, interact with the people around you and them with you. And also, the space is kind of activated with these highly elaborate sculptural uh, chandeliers that are hanging uh, from the ceiling. Um, the next example that I wanted to show is a large um, uh, condo project, again, we did on the Aegean coast in Turkey, uh, where we had to, again, create a similar type of balance between uh, private and public. Um, there was a, an immense amount of concern about um, finding a balance of visibility but also privacy at the same time. So the entire uh, facade of the buildings that are offset and um, aligned with each other are um, sheltered by this, these series of terraces that have uh, these undulating planters in front of them. So these planters allow as tools to uh, conceal certain activities, but the other activities are being revealed uh, as people inhabit the terrace areas that they're with. And the buildings are offset, uh, and also the undulation is offset so that there's a variety of visibility and privacy options. Uh, in order to accomplish this level of complexity, again, we proposed a similar kind of uh, formless uh, robotic molding technology uh, that we are in the process of developing in-house, where we would have unique panels uh, that are made out of, uh, um, again, fabric-based um, molding processes, uh, where each individual panel is uh, unique, but it, it doesn't require a mold, so it removes a kind of a wasteful process in between. And in order to communicate some of the design parameters, such as the distances between the buildings, uh, and how they're offset, we created, uh, I would say, probably one of the first uh, virtual reality scenes that were uh, created in uh, architectural presentations uh, about like three years ago. So uh, we made six different uh, virtual reality scenes with different kinds of uh, gaps in the courtyard, and we basically uh, proved our point to the client that uh, the buildings are not actually as close as he thinks they are, to each other. Another thing that we did was about, uh, again, a kind of a um, question about the width of the balconies. And uh, we, again, created a series of virtual reality scenes uh, with different widths of balconies. And then we, that allowed the client to pick which one is more efficient, because the more balcony space you have, the, the less leasable space you're getting. So you have to kind of find a balance between outdoor spaces versus um, profitable indoor spaces for the developer. 
Um, so these were some of the more building oriented projects, but in the scale of installations, I would say probably the first exploration in this process was this project uh, that we did a few years ago called the Cerebral Hut. And, uh, and what you're seeing is a video of a physically moving panel that is activated by an electromechanical system in a, in a, in a very large scale immersive installation that has different sets of motions from the interior versus the exterior of the system. And the entire motion is being controlled by a headset called an EEG headset that measures your concentration levels. So the more you concentrate, the more you have an ability to physically transform that environment around you. Uh, another project which was designed for uh, an electronic music producer called Actress, who is a very interesting character. He takes recordings from uh, NASA uh, sound recordings from, let's say, the Voyager, and he samples them into his music. He records uh, micro motions such as a piece of wood warping, and then he turns that into dance music. Um, so he actually has very interesting, uh, he has a very interesting mind. So he approached us to put together a pavilion uh, which would serve as some kind of um, pop-up store during the day and would become a backdrop for his performance during the evening. And um, the, the proposal that we submitted to him is this uh, highly elaborate um, assemblage that um, is assembled and disassembled by robots very slowly throughout the day, throughout the week, the entire time. So the robots are constantly, tirelessly assembling and disassembling the system. Um, and the reason why they're moving very slowly is because they're dangerous. Um, you cannot basically cohabit with these things uh, when they're mo moving in full speed. But uh, basically, they become a part of the performance uh, during the evening. And also, the, the small pieces that they're assembling have different levels of transparency and reflectivity. So the way that they interact with the lighting design also evolves and changes throughout the day. Uh, another project is uh, called Morphogram, which was a pro proposal we did for uh, LACMA's uh, art and technology program is this uh, floating roof canopy actuated by drones. And um, so the, the premise is that they can actuate this triangulated net to cycle through multiple different kinds of architectural types, such as dome and portico and pyramid and what have you, uh, as a first step. And as a second step, you can uh, hook it up to a body tracking system where you can have this uh, kinetic architectural feature interact with another kind of performance, such as a dancer. And as a last step, uh, as in a kind of a Christo-esque way, um, this uh, floating canopy would conceal and reveal uh, existing pieces of artwork in their collection uh, as, a way, as a way to interact with an existing kind of curatorial approach. Um, another project which was an intervention that we did at the Venice Architecture Biennale called Project Source Code, uh, where it was the first augmented reality uh, guerrilla style um, exhibition where uh, you would have to download an app before you go to the exhibit and you would also have a treasure map and you would uh, point your camera to these moments in the physical exhibition based on the treasure map. And these entire contextually situated digital models would pop up in the space. So there was a, a covert exhibition overlaid into the physical exhibition that you could unravel uh, through your smart homes, uh, through your uh, mobile devices. And uh, the point of this was that, uh, in a way, to crit critique the uh, curatorial direction of, of the exhibition, which was called uh, Fundamentals of Architecture. But somehow the fundamentals were talking about architectural uh, discourse before 1990. And so in a way, what we did was to include seminal digital 
uh, projects starting from 1990 onwards that have had a huge amount of influence. And what, what we did was a kind of a digital archiving process where we acquired existing historic digital models from architects and uh, we situated them into spaces. So um, the, the polemic behind the project was to, in a way, um, think about digital artifacts also as a form of archaeology uh, because we're accumulating immense amounts of data and they need to be somehow organized and be treated like the physical objects that we have accumulated and are displaying in museums. Um, the next project is uh, a project that we did for NASA's uh, Jet Propulsion Lab campus uh, in Pasadena, California. Um, the engineers were talking, initially they approached us to uh, design them a new kind of um, interior space. And uh, because they said, like, we're using a lot of VR headsets, we're using a lot of augmented reality, everybody's working on their laptops, the existing kind of um, cubicle system is no longer working for us. So after our multiple consultations with them, it turned out that if the weather was nice, majority of them would be outside in the beautiful JPL campus with their laptops. And they would only go in when their battery is dying. Uh, and then uh, they would charge up their battery and then they would go out again. Or if they're meeting, again, they're kind of crammed into this uh, office building that I built in the 70s and it's kind of moldy, carpeted, not so great, uh, yada, yada, yada. And or if they're using, let's say, highly specialized virtual reality equipment, then they're indoors, obviously, in a highly light controlled environment. So. Uh, so we said like, okay, we'll do like an interior design project for you, whatever, that's great. But um, how about we propose a kind of an outdoor feature for you uh, that would uh, allow you to fulfill some of these different kinds of uh, new modes of productivity, I would say, um, such as they're, they're completely mixed with leisure, right? Um, because you're basically just communicating with people in a highly leisurely way. So what we decided to do is to create this platform uh, which has integrated furniture in it and a robotically actuated canopy would shield you for needs of shade and privacy as needed. So you would, uh, from a digital interface, sign out, let's say, the meeting table for a certain uh, set of hours and the robotic canopy would take position to shield that particular location uh, and to shade it so that you will be in a shaded environment but still be outside for your meeting. Uh, another one would be this kind of more elaborate presentation scenario where there's a um, uh, very small scale amphitheater and the robotic canopy would, would become this, this projection board. And the reason why it's kind of sh uh, shaped like a sphere is so that it could shade itself when there's a digital projection happening on top of it. And another one is this kind of continuous chaise where you can uh, lay down, but in a kind of a cleaner context rather than just laying on grass. And the fourth one is a water feature. So. Uh, this kind of dialogue started due to a previous project, uh, which was a competition that NASA did, uh, an open competition, uh, international competition, to design the first uh, four astronaut habitat for the first mission to Mars. So we entered this project, this competition, and we were tied for the third place uh, with the European Space Agency. And uh, the project that we proposed uh, or as a part of the requirement, not only that you had to design this uh, habitat, but also you had to uh, propose a very specific fabrication strategy that takes advantage of the indigenous materials and resources on Mars. And there was a very specific number of 90% that you had to achieve in order to do that. So um, the, the fabrication strategy that we proposed was uh, about collecting, grinding, and heating, and fibering uh, basalt rocks 
which is very abundant uh, on the surface of Mars. So anytime you see something gray instead of red on the surface of Mars, that is basalt. And you can turn that into uh, a material that behaves very similarly to carbon fiber. And uh, through these uh, fabrics that would be built, you could robotically uh, process these fabrics in order to extrude pipes through uh, pre-woven sleeves, as well as um, positioning these uh, fabrics almost like tents and tension them. And you can drench them with resins that are um, that harden through UV light. And Mars has a almost a non-existent atmosphere that is made out of mostly uh, carbon dioxide. And there's nothing that actually filters the UV light. So any time you would pour a UV curing resin on top of these surfaces, they would instantly cure. So basically, you have an instant uh, tent system that automatically hardens and solidifies and turns into uh, high-performance architecture um, in a matter of minutes. Okay. So that was the fabrication strategy. And the architectural strategy, we raised the system above so that uh, underneath uh, rovers and other equipment could be stored. And it also allowed us to create a clean room uh, or like a kind of a transitional dirty room where the astronauts would be much lower to the ground so that uh, it's much less likely for them to uh, carry fine dust on the Martian surface to the upper chambers, which would have sensitive research equipment um, in order to, in a way, shelter uh, the equipment from any kind of damage. And as a part of this presentation, we also created this, this virtual reality scene in a way to demonstrate to them what this structure would look like. And, uh, and the reason, some of the more stylistic decisions we made was due to the fact that um, this project, whenever it happens, and they're projecting it to happen in 20 years, uh, still needs to be a kind of an iconic structure in the same way that the structures on Earth that are prominent, that are civic structures like museums and what have you, are iconic. They need to capture the attention and the imagination of the public in order to maintain a kind of a prolonged interest in the project. So that's why it's flashy, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and also, we did an interior scene almost like a video game in order to simulate what kind of environment uh, the astronauts would be inhabiting. And as a kind of a culmination of a set of these different ideas, the last project I'm about to show you is a proposal that we did for um, Coachella Music Festival, which was a pavilion that has these uh, robotically actuated uh, wings and a series of uh, video projections that happen on its surface. So the components of this system is that there's a, there's a structural frame, and uh, three robots are situated on top of this frame. There's a fabric membrane that is stretched to the structural frame, and the robots are holding this super lightweight carbon fiber uh, wings that have an ability to change their position. And there are three projectors that project different kinds of uh, media content on the exterior in the evening. And during the day, I'm showing it to be moving much faster than it does. But what it is doing, in fact, is that it is shading, uh, maximizing the amount of shade by following the sun. Uh, and in the evening, it becomes this kind of signage and this kind of um, um, sculptural uh, feature in the skyline of Coachella, but it also has an augmented reality feature to it through the application that you would download on your phone. You would be able to point your phone to the patterns that are changing on the exterior surface of the pavilion. And once you do that, uh, you would get set times of different uh, performers in different parts of the festival. And once you click on a particular artist, it would, the wings would 
move in that direction to point you in that direction so that you know exactly where to go. I don't know if any of you have been to Coachella, but it has seven stages. There's around 150 to 200,000 people uh, every weekend. It's, it's a gigantic um, urbanism of sorts. Uh, and uh, the point of this was to add a certain kind of marker, um, like a clock tower of sorts to, to that urbanism. And the last project that I'm going to talk about, which is uh, something that we are developing through the support of uh, Google's uh, machine learning uh, department, is this uh, kinetic uh, sculpture that combines virtual reality and uh, artificial intelligence uh, called Cypher. Um, I don't want to bore you with the, with the technicalities of, the, of this thing. But what I will talk about is that the intent of this sculpture is to combine uh, soft robotics, machine vision, and electromechanical systems in order to bridge the gap between the digital and the physical worlds. And um, as, a, as a kind of an artistic uh, object that has motions and behaviors, uh, the more it interacts with different kinds of people, the more it develops different kinds of physical behaviors, and then it starts veering away from its original set of parameters that it was designed for. So what exactly is it? It's a sculpture that is roughly around this high uh, with a silicon skin. And, uh, and in the silicon skin, there's a series of electromechanical actuators as well as a series of uh, pneumatically controlled actuators. And it also has a tail. At the end of the tail is a virtual reality headset. So when you, in a way, put the headset on, you become a part of the physical, um, I would say, composition of the sculpture. So there's an existing aluminum frame that we built uh, that is connected through a series of uh, 3D printed steel joints because they're all in a different angle. And um, then there's a series of um, linear actuators that are situated at the center of this. And a series of depth sensing and facial recognition cameras that are organized in an array so that the, sense, so that the sculpture can sense your position and your presence and determine who you are. And this is how the, the array of uh, the depth sensing cameras are organized so that it is, in a way, a full spectrum of 360 um, distribution. And, um, and there's a series of um, 3D printed uh, thermoplastic components that are at the bottom of the sculpture, uh, which we have developed a process for uh, 3D printing in-house. Uh, the thermoplastic is uh, infused with uh, carbon fiber so that it is not as brittle as, as the regular 3D printing material so that when people are walking around it or if they kick it by accident, it doesn't break. And on top is these um, um, series of inflating chambers that have embedded infrared sensors so that when you move your hand over it, um, they, in fact, inflate. So based on the proximity of your hand, the entire top part portion of the sculpture uh, changes position in a kind of a micro scale level. So there's like hundreds of components to the sculpture where, like I would say, 95% done. And um, I talked about this. And then there are the, the, the parts in between are um, silicon membranes that are poured into molds that were uh, CNC milled. So as you can see, which I think would resonate with a lot of you here, is that we are using highly specialized digital fabrication techniques with very hands-on physical fabrication. So the, the, the final effect of the, the silicon panels. So as you're seeing, the linear actuators would be uh, moving large panels, like 
portions of the of the sculpture based on your proximity. Uh, so this is the this is the physical uh, makeup of the sculpture. But what exactly happens with the tail is a different story, which I'm about to introduce in a second. So basically, uh, through the help of the uh, VR headset, you're teleported inside the sculpture as if you're a small person in it. Um, so uh, the kind of vista that you're getting is something in the world of, um, but before I talk about, let me talk about actually the feature of the helmet. Uh, once you put the helmet on, the helmet physically inflates. So it in a way transforms the way that people outside of you sees you. But you have no awareness of that reality because your entire vision is blocked and you're teleported inside the sculpture. So again, it problematizes the relationship between sculpture and architecture, turning them into each other uh, through a kind of a technological bridge, but also it problematizes the relationship between sculpture and fashion, because it almost becomes this incredibly oversized accessory that you have been consumed by the aesthetic language of. So what you see in the interior and again, please uh, bear with me, these are like very elementary uh, simulations that we are doing. Uh, and uh, they have become much more complex at this point, but I don't have the video recording of them yet. Is this kind of, um, uh, I would say, dreamlike environment where a lot of uh, rules of physics don't, no longer apply. So with your hand gestures, you can transform that environment. When you transform the virtual reality scene, the physical sculpture moves exactly the same way. And when somebody through the sensors approaches the sculpture, the virtual reality scene that you're seeing transforms the same way as well. So there's a complete experiential uh, continuity between the digital and the physical experiences that are happening. And we're experimenting with different kinds of ambient um, qualities, such as different colored lights. Now that we had, uh, have added all sorts of various uh, particle simulations into the system. So you're almost like inside this architectural creature of sorts. Uh, and it creates multiple different sets of sensorial experiences through different kinds of uh, visual workflows. And also like these kinds of gestures are tracked by the sensors that are embedded in the headset but you have no idea that your gestures are being tracked, in fact. Uh, and this allows you to experience this virtual environment in a way that is completely immersive because you don't know, you don't see the technology, you only see the impact of it in a simulation. And also you don't know the physical impact of that technology to the sculpture itself. Okay. So I believe that is my last slide. Um, if you wanna see more projects, you can always go to my website. And if you wanna reach out to me for any reason, you can email at info at ozaloffice.com or givench at ozaloffice.com, which is my personal email. Um, thank you so much.